This is not a result of a decision made from a boardroom of a large international corporate conglomerate looking to expand market share. It's not a product developed by market research into the viability of LED lighting. It's certainly not a venture capital-backed startup company focused on green technology. This is a product that has been forged from the American story. A story that built a town, employed thousands, and went through many transitions along the way. I'm Alan Brink. I'm president of Spring City Electrical Manufacturing. I came here in 1987 when a business partner of mine, Andy Miller, and I bought the facility from uh, Sam Marcus and Mort Cantor. Sam Marcus's father bought the place in 1923, and it has been operating continuously since then. My name is Sam Marcus. I started the work at Spring City Foundry Company in 1948. My father owned the plant, and I think I became president of the company about six years later. And the place dated back to the 1820s. It gone broke so many times that they called it the White Elephant. In the 1800s and early 1900s, this was predominantly a stove foundry. The sign says Spring City Stove Works. You talk to the real old timers in this town and they will refer to this as the White Elephant Foundry. White Elephant being something that's not used for anything. Unfortunately, Spring City Stove Works was using predominantly nickel-plated stoves. Once porcelain became available, Nobody wanted to buy nickel plate anymore. And that was kind of the end of us as a stove foundry. Every town going back 100 to 200 years ago here in the state of Pennsylvania, just about every small town had a foundry in it because it was one of the basic industries back then. Then we were making the motion picture projectors and that was the bulk of the business. He was making castings for people who made motion picture projector bases. The motion picture projectors in those days were big things, quite heavy, and you had to have a strong support underneath. It was a company called National Theater Supply. He was making the projectors for them. Then he got RCA. We then evolved in the 1940s to uh, 1960s, predominantly into electrical products. The foundry realized that in order to substantially grow, they needed to shift gears to a specific product line. Spring City increasingly gained knowledge of electrical applications, such as manufacturing fixtures, poles, and especially junction boxes. In 1947, Spring City Electrical Manufacturing Company was formed. With the formation of the new company, along with help from his soon-to-be successor and son, Sam Marcus, Mr. Marcus ushered in a revitalization of the company. When we made the electrical products, we registered the name Spring City Electric so that when we sold electrical distributors and contractors, they wouldn't figure we were some crazy animal that was pounding metal. In 1948, the year that I came there, my father bid a job in New York City. We, we lost money on it, but uh, you know, it, it got us into the business. We never believed that anybody would use anything like it anywhere else. In fact, when I first, we first went, some people used to laugh at us. You know. Who wants to use those old-fashioned lampposts? Soon after, famous installations such as Society Hill and Washington, D.C. followed. The innovation, American spirit, and hard work which enabled the company to win famous installation projects would soon help San Marcos propel the company to grow throughout both large and small cities across the United States. This was a unique business, and it was a unique business that had a very unique market position. Uh, we are the major producer of ornate cast iron lampposts for the cities of Boston, New York, Washington, and Philadelphia. I mean, actually, if you were to take a look at the lampposts in front of the U.S. Capitol, they are made by us. And most of what you see on the streets of D.C. is made by us. Mr. Brink inherited a company with substantial knowledge and expertise. For the next 20 years, Mr. Brink assumed the role of growing the company and expanding not only the geographic footprint, but understood that in order to survive in a climate of poor quality imports and globalization of companies, Spring City had to set themselves apart. By creating an atmosphere of partnership, not just customers, and holding the manufacturing to the highest standards, 
Spring City continued to grow. This is a picture that is familiar to a lot of people. The World Trade Center after 9-11. While the building is in shambles, right there standing is a Bishop's Crook lamppost made of ductile iron produced by Spring City Electrical Manufacturing. Even though the building didn't make it, a ductile iron lamppost was still standing. That's the reason that we offer 25-year warranties on ductile iron lampposts, is if they can survive this, they can survive anything. Unbeknownst to Mr. Brink, Spring City was on the verge of innovation in the first few years of the new century. A new market was soon to be emerging, and Spring City was one of the first pioneers with the launch of the Symphonic LED in 2010. After years of research and development, Spring City's LED introduction outperformed and outlasted anything else in the market. History repeats itself, and proof is the award of the Central Park LED relighting project to Spring City. After beating all other competitors on performance, NYC chose Spring City's Symphonic LED to light the pathways traveled by people across the globe. Innovation is the fuel that fires the foundry's furnace at Spring City. In the past seven years, the company has continued to respond and surpass market expectations with the launch of a true LED conversion kit, the X-Series, and the continued growth of installations, both large and small, throughout the country. No, this product was not manufactured by the largest lighting company, nor will it ever have the distinction of owning the largest market share. But this product represents both the power and innovation of the American spirit, past, present, and especially future. There are a lot of foundries that existed back then when Andy and I bought the place that don't exist anymore. And we are kind of in the foundry industry, one of a relatively small number of survivors. We were happy to survive. You know, you talk about expansion. We just wanted to survive. I think it is probably the second or third longest manufacturing facility in the county. The question is survival. And that's a major accomplishment. I give my father credit for that.